Welcome to the Workology podcast, where we discuss the science and art of the workplace, gain powerful insights, resources, and perspectives on the industries of human resources and recruiting. Join your host, Jessica Miller Merrill, chief blogger of bloggingforjobs.com, for a 45 minute in depth and no holes barred look into the future of our most powerful business asset, the employee. And now, here's your host, Jessica, with this episode of Workology. Hi, guys. This is Jessica Miller Merrill, and I want to welcome you to the Workology podcast. It's great to have you on. Um, on our new podcast is part of the Blogging for Jobs and the Recruiters Lounge blog family. Our first guest and for the inaugural podcast is Jason Seiden. Welcome, Jason. Thank you, Jessica, for risking your entire new podcast with me as your as your early guest. We have some good topics today. Today's podcast title is How Your Employees Are Positively Amplifying Your Brand. It, it, it seems like on the news we hear about somebody taking a picture of them sitting on lettuce and a parties or um, somebody getting fired for something that they're doing on social media. And so today's podcast is here to talk about how we can positively use or work with our employee population to make our our brand, um, I guess, more genuine, transparent, and just all around better. Yeah, what a novel concept, right? Yeah. So so let's talk a little bit about you. Who's, who is Jason Seiden? Uh, you know what? I really? <laughs> <laughs> Who is Jessica Miller Merrill? Changes. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's um, it's interesting. So, you know, a, a lot of people, a lot of people are going to know me. Uh, you know, you and I have been in this community for a, for a long time in a digital space, and a lot of folks are going to know me from what I used to do uh, in terms of professional development. You know, I had written books about failure and overcoming failure and embracing it and making the most of your career. And what was really interesting was that about uh, four or five years ago, I started getting a lot of requests for uh, social media business help. And to make a long story short, uh, what, what, I, what we had an intuitive understanding of then and what's becoming increasingly clear is that while social media looks uh, light and quick and easy on the, on the outside, it actually is having a, a very profound impact on the employer-employee relationship. And so what started as just a part of my practice area very quickly became an entire business. So I think the, the relevant part of my story for this is uh, the topic of today, this is where I live, right? How not only uh, about you know, how HR can get employees and employers working together to create an employer brand and to help with recruiting and engagement and all these good things, but also what's the impact of all these new tools on that process and where do they enable it and where do they create problems and, and how does a company uh, get ahead of this curve so that they can they can put a plan in place that's sustainable over time. Agreed, agreed. And so th this concept is, uh, I guess, loosely called employment branding. And um, I know that Glassdoor.com is going to be hosting their first ever Glassdoor Employment Branding Summit. So um, the, the idea is that recruitment, this recruitment marketing, and we share an employee stories to build relationships with existing employees. And imagine that we want to keep them around, and then uh, future employees. So what what is your definition of employer brand? And and do you think it's different from recruitment marketing? Because sometimes I put those two together, but are they the same thing? Yeah, you know, and and bef so before I answer that, let's make a bigger mess. You also have advocacy marketing, employee brand advocacy. Uh, you know, when when we came out years ago, we we came up with this term workforce marketing because we just we needed some sort of lingo to talk about it. Nothing existed yet. Uh, in terms of what's an employer brand, it's what people say about your company as an employer, and I, I think. The really important part of that definition is it's not what you say, it's not how you hope you're perceived, it's what people say about you as an employer. So that is your employer brand. It's it's your reputation. It's uh, it, it's not your benefits. It's not the ping pong table. It it literally is. It's your reputation and the expectations that people have of you um, as an employer. Uh, how is it different from recruitment marketing? I think that's a really important question. Uh, you know, the relationship between your employer brand and recruitment marketing is the same relationship that a company's brand and a company's marketing programs, product marketing, uh, have. 
So, you know, the brand is the promise of you as an organization and what you stand for and people's expectations and, and your reputation and all that. Recruitment marketing, those are campaigns that you run to make your recruiting process more efficient. Okay. Okay. Well, th- I think that's a good broader understanding for, for where we're going in this. It's kind of like the whole talent network, talent community, email list concept. It's sometimes it's very the same, but when, and people talk about it interchangeably, but when you uh, really get down to the bones of it, they are very different. Mm -hmm, Definitely. Why do you think it's important for employers uh, to think about employees uh, as part of their employment branding? Yeah. What, so I love that question. Uh, and, and let's be candid. I, I think most of them don't. Uh, when it comes to employer branding, our experience is that where companies are right now is they're going to listen to this conversation and they're going, employer brand, what, huh? And their head's going to slightly explode because they, they have this brand in their head and it's all on the marketing and sales side, right? It's, this is what our company stands for and this is why people buy our products and this is why people come back. And you know, now you have this whole notion of you as an employer. So, you know, suddenly this is now impacting sales somehow and it's impacting recruit. Like, God. It. So at the moment, I think a, you know, very few companies are actually savvy enough to understand exactly what their employer brand is even about, let alone why they should be engaging with their employees. Uh, but once they figure out what it's about, I think what what these companies are going to realize is because of social media, your employees, your prospective employees, your customers, and your prospective customers are all mixed up. The Venn diagrams you know, of, of how all those people exist in the world, they, they get mixed. You have prospective employees and prospective customers who are friends with each other, who are interacting on Facebook, who are reading one another's reviews on Yelp. So your reputation as an employer is affecting sales. And... Uh, you know, your, the quality of the products you make is affecting whether or not people want to come work for you. So the more you get your employees involved in defining your employer brand, the more you work together with them to get your employer brand, number one, the more sustainable the process is because you're going to get to the truth. And number two, the more effective you're going to be because you're going to get to the truth. You're going to know what you have to work on and you're going to know what wins you can celebrate. So wait, so wait a minute here. I want to, I want to get this straight. We have to ask our employees what they think of our brand before we build an employer branding campaign? You cannot build an employer branding campaign because it's not, that's exactly right. Because your employer brand is not what you managers say it is, right? Here's what happens. When managers go into a room, when leadership goes into a room and defines to the best of their ability, their employer brand, they come out with, we're an employer of choice and we like great people and we want passionate people who are high energy and innovative and smart thinkers. And, and you already know what they're going to say. And you know what? Every other company on planet Earth would say the exact same thing. And none of it is your brand. Your, your brand is what employees say and what prospective employees say. So the only way you can effectively build an employer brand is if you call up your employees and you say, hey, by the way, what do you like about working here? What is it? What keeps you coming back? And what should we work on? Like what's not working too well? And when your friend who comes in for an interview calls you up and says, you know, hey, should I take this job? What are you going to tell them? Those are the things that are going to be in your brand. And I promise you, the things that you hear from your employees are not going to be like, oh my gosh, I love coming here because I'm a passionate person and you're all passionate people and we're passionate every single day. They might say that a little bit, but then they're going to tell you something else too. They're going to say, I love working on exciting work or, um, you know, the things are, free. who knows what they're going to tell you, but they're going to tell you the truth, not what you hope the truth will be. I think that's an important distinction I, because it's so easy to sit in a boardroom or behind your cubicle in your desk or, or wherever and, and come up with the, these ideas of what you think what you believe the company stands for. But when you're a manager or a business leader, your perspective is not the perspective of, of the average employee or the community of people that are working at, at your company or your office. Mm-hmm. No, that's exactly right. right? And, and you, like, you think about it, in our personal lives, we already know this is true. You know, you walk into a room, you go to a high school reunion, 
right? And, and a lot of the stress that a lot of people feel about their high school reunion is you go, wow, over the last 10 or 20 or 30 years, I've changed, but I'm going to walk into this room and it's going to be all the same patterns from 10 or 20, 30 years ago. You know, my, repu my reputation in their eyes has frozen. And that's either good or bad, depending on, you know, that reputation. But it, it's, the same, it's the same kind of concept. You as a manager, you can go off in a room, you can do whatever you want. Your reputation, and, you know, it, that's held by others. And unless you're actively engaged with them, you can't possibly shift that brand in their eyes. So I'm going to go a little off course here from kind of the questions and the conversation that you and, and I were having before we hit the record button. But I, I, I'm thinking that most managers or HR people or, or those that are listening in are going to say, so what do I do? What do I do? How do I talk to these employees and find out what they think of my brand or what our employer brand stands for? or What's important? What, where, where do they start? Yeah, that's, that's such a magic, such a magic question. Uh, there's a there's a tendency for people to start with uh, conversation, right? What are people talking about? You know, I I think in order, I you know, me manager, I'm thinking, well, gee, maybe I, maybe I should go listen on social and just hear what people are saying, and that's that's a part of the answer. But I think the real answer, where you really get a bigger impact, and you know, over the last few years, where we have been able to drive real meaningful, sustainable impact for our clients is starting with self-identification. How do your employees self-identify? And if you can, you know, number one, take stock of the level to which your employees self-identify with the company's brand. And number two, give them a very concrete way to self-identify with the brand, right? And, and by concrete way, I mean, you've got to give them a reason to actually self-identify with the brand. You know, how do they make the company's brand work for them as professionals? That's the first step. Once you do that, and once your employees actually understand how the company's brand can help them as individuals, then you can move to the next step, which is engage them in conversation, get them to act as advocates, uh, you know, get, get the feedback that you need to, to create some hypotheses and some changes with where you think your your employer brand is and, and is going. But definitely step one, get your employees to self-identify with the company's message. I like that. I, I, I think that this is a good first step and, and something that is obtainable, right? Through a series of in-person meetings or focus group conversations, uh, you can start to understand how, how they're identifying and, and, and with what. Yeah, oh my gosh. Yeah, it, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. Like, so the um so you know, I'll, I'll speak from from my experience right there's there's a tendency for companies to issue a social media policy and then demand that all their employees comply with this policy and some companies go so far as to creating language that they want employees to copy and paste into their linkedin profiles uh you know or use on social and you think about that for a second what a missed opportunity you don't learn anything in that process, except who's non-compliant. But you know, when we go into our clients, we create an opt-in process. Right? So you've got your focus groups, you've got your, your lunch meetings and all of that, and, and don't take any of that away. But if you give employees options and you make them partners in telling the company's story and you give them the flexibility to opt in to company messaging, you actually create a feedback loop where you can then go and look at what they're actually doing. What have they decided to share and how did they share it on LinkedIn or on a Twitter bio or wherever? And now you can actually, you can data back from that. You can say, oh, wow, you know what? We had, we had six hypotheses around what our brand might be. And it, you know, it turns out hypotheses one, two, and three 50% or, you know, 80% of our employees use hypotheses one, two, and three, and only 20% used four, five, and six. I think maybe the truth is in one, two, or three. You know, so, you know, with the, with the right process, you can get incredible feedback on where your employees are at and, and what your next step should be. And it's just, it's amazing to me how many companies just skip right over that. Uh, and within social media, they skip over it by, by pushing policies and compliance rather than 
guidelines and, and giving choices. Agreed. So, so now that they've sat down with people, um, I guess, where do they, where do they go from, from here? They, they kind of have an understanding. They've talked to people. What, what's step two? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So it depends on the company. Uh, there's going to be some companies that at step two, uh, they need to create a little loop. Once they get their employees starting to identify with the brand, there's going to be a little learning for them. And they may learn that what they thought their brand was, uh, wasn't quite accurate. Or that what their brand is turning out to be may not be easily reconciled with their product brand. So at this point, you know, leadership may have to step in and say, you know what, we need to think about this from a master brand standpoint. And we need to bring marketing and HR together. And we need to do a little soul searching as a company to understand really what we stand for and, and how these two things uh, play together. And, and right, that's, that's a step. Uh, there are other companies where the employer brand is going to be pretty clear. And, and for them, it's really a matter, once that's in place, to moving to the recruitment marketing that you were talking about. How do we get the word out there? Uh, who are the people in the world that are really going to resonate with this brand? How do we reach them? How do we convince them that we're a great place to work? And, and then how do we move them through that process? I like this part because um, HR doesn't always um, talk with other entities outside of, uh, of HR. So um, this suddenly puts human resources or recruiting or whoever's in charge of, of this employment branding process in the same room uh, with the marketing folks or the product folks. And now conversations are being had about how this directly impacts all parties in the room. You got it. Is, a, is really a new thing. Yeah, suddenly recruiting and engagement and retention have a real tie to, uh, to the business. That's exactly right. And I almost feel like this has been missing for a really long time because human resources are, as a department is a, uh, a non-revenue generating uh, entity. So they're just, you know, they're sending their expenses out, but they're not really recouping any money in, or at least it's hard to like direct that point to, to, to where exactly, you know, different parties are benefiting from. So uh, by having HR in the marketing conversation and, and this, this new sort of employment branding concept, um, now we can kind of tie um, what HR is doing uh, directly to, uh, you know, revenue or the bottom line. So do you think HR is ready for that conversation? Oh, no, we're not. At all. That's, that's why we're having this podcast. And, 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 I mean, it's over. I would think like for me, it just kind of like boggles the mind. Like this is exciting. This is great. I've been waiting for this, you know, day to come. But um, I would say that most practitioners in HR, uh, they are still hung up with what Twitter. I have to listen to people on social media. So, um, or you know, we we're going to entrust our employees to tell us how they view our company, and and we're going to run with that. I mean, that's. Um, it's not just HR, it's business leaders too. That's a hard, uh, I guess, position of you no longer have the control. Well, control's out the window. I think that's exactly right. Uh, and in fact, I had, I had a, um, a director of marketing once tell me, right? I mean, so I, I pitched her in a sales meeting and I said, look, you know what, if we, if we go through our process, you've got 6,000 employees. If we get 10% of them to, to go through our process, suddenly you have 600 people who will actively be interested in in retweeting your stuff and in sharing your information, you you won't you won't have to work as hard to feed the content beast because you'll have this the six hundred person army behind you. And she looked at me dead in the eye, and she said, "Well, if if we have six hundred people helping to create and share content, then what's my job?" And you know, she couldn't she couldn't see the leadership that those folks would need. She couldn't see the direction that she would be able to provide them, or the you know the glue that she would provide to keep them together. And you know, that unfortunately. That's that's true. That that kind of mentality exists all over. But you know what? There's going to be people who are listening to this who I think are itching for a change, and if they can see that that very fear uh, about the loss of control is the opportunity, and that they can shepherd, they can help marketing and they can help the leadership team by shepherding them through a change process, and by helping these folks see, you know, what we tell our clients. You think your problem is content sharing. You think it's 
coming up with the right words and language for your brand, you think it's a scalable solution, you think it's results, you think it's control. The problem that you have as a company is that your employees are overwhelmed. They don't understand how your brand helps them personally. They don't know why they should ever share it, either socially or uh, in conversation. They, you're asking them to take steps and communicate things that make them feel stupid because they don't understand what you're asking them to do. You're making them feel insecure because their jobs are changing and the way they communicate is changing. And if you can give them an anchor and you can give them an incremental path that is rooted in the why and how the company brand helps them individually, then that's how you then create this feedback loop where you can get information from them about your brand and you can get them to advocate for you and you can get all the things you want over time in a very responsible, controlled process, even though the outcome itself is beyond anybody's control. I'm listening to you and I'm thinking about uh, my own brand with our blog and we have 28 writers and they have free range to talk about whatever topic or blog that they want to share on, on blogging for jobs. And, um, they help shape the overall brand. Um, you know, part of it's me, but what's where the power for us is, is that they are, are the voice. It's, it's not my brand. It's not my blog anymore. It's, um, all of us together, uh, working together towards one goal, which for us is, to talk about uh, the practitioners and educate um, for the HR and recruiting industry. And uh, what I find interesting uh, when I'm talking to HR technology companies or service providers in our space that are struggling to try to reach practitioners, it's the same thing. Uh, they don't want to give up the control um, of a customer or somebody else sharing their personal experience with the product because that's a really scary thing. And, and what if they screw it up or maybe I won't have a job as, as the CMO of an of a HR tech company. But I will tell you that uh, for me, um, with the traffic that we get and the great community that we have of readers, um, it, it's happening and there is really, uh, only, it's two people, myself, um, Blake for my team, and then a group of freelancers who help me in, in different areas and consultants that I work with. It's a small team, and mm -hmm. we're competing with LinkedIn and Monster and all these other big companies uh, with the community that we're providing uh, on our blog. You, you said some some in, a couple of things that were that really stood out to me. You know, one is the uh, the fear that others have, like you know, hey, if we re you, we release the hounds, what if one of these hounds makes a mistake and my answer to, and I'm sure you've lived this too, Jessica, is it's not if, it's when. Everybody's going to screw up, right? So, you know, you can, you can sit there and cower, uh, but you're, you're fearing the inevitable. So the faster you can embrace that, the faster you can put a process together that, that just allows you to absorb mistakes and learn from them and move on. Uh, the other thing that you said that was interesting is, you know, you highlight the difference between you and uh, some of your larger competitors. And one of the things that we talk about with our with our clients is is that your impact your whatever you want to call it your workforce marketing impact your employer brand impact the equation that we use is reach times resonance uh, divided by cost times effort that's your impact your reach times your resonance divided by the cost of of putting the content out there right and the effort required to do it and the denominator we don't have to worry about like it's it, the denominator. This is the reason why we're all moving to social media is because the denominator on social is much lower than through broadcast channels. But the numerator is very interesting. Most of the folks, when they go to execute an employer brand or any kind of messaging, uh, especially on social, they just focus on reach. Right? You name two huge competitors. LinkedIn has a, has a massive campaign right now to become everybody, every professional's homepage and, and to get content out there. But what you bring to the table is you bring resonance within the HR space. You know, blogging for jobs has been around for a while. It's known for something. The content fits within a very specific niche and is incredibly valuable within that niche. So you're able to offer a much higher level of resonance than any of those major competitors because they have to appeal to a, a mass audience. And you know, that's, 
that's a piece that I think a lot of organizations are missing. You, know, you can control reach. You can, you can go buy Twitter followers. You can go, you know, you can, or it's a little illusory, but you can appear to control reach. You can, you can measure what your reach is and what your secondary reach is. And the numbers are, are you know, amazing. Like, oh my gosh, I had 2 million Twitter impressions, but, but they're meaningless unless you couple them with resonance. And really, resonance is not a retweet. Resonance starts with how your people self-identify. You've got 26, 28 writers. You know, imagine how hard it would be to manage them if they didn't already care about the space and believe in the vision and direction of blogging for jobs. That's where it starts. Yeah. Well, and, and I can tell you, I mean, really, you can game, you can game Twitter, you can game hashtags, uh, all that can be done. And it looks nice on a spreadsheet. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, what really matters to me is when I'm in a conference and somebody walks up and says, you know, I launched this campaign because I read this blog or I changed my policy or did a training because of what we read here. I mean, that's, that's what I think really matters. People are, are taking it upon themselves to, to drive a change and that goes beyond, you know, 50 well, that's what, sure. That's what keeps them coming back. Right. I mean, to the extent that you've got to maintain a business and sustain it, what keeps them coming back is getting real value from you. So I, I, I could not agree with you more. Uh, you know, it, you could you could game it and you could post some really nice numbers and you're going to have a great year and next year you're going to crash. Or you could focus on the fundamentals and you could be around for a long, long time. So how do employers focus on being around for a long, long time or keeping their employees around for a long, long time uh, around like this idea of them being like a brand ambassador for the company? Uh, what, do, what does that look like? So, so start with the end in mind, right? Like, what do you want? You, you, want, uh, you want your employees to actually, let me use an analogy and I'll, I'll come back to this, right? Starting with the end in mind, uh, <clears throat> a friend of mine the other day was telling me a story that um, you know, this was being relayed to me. It's it's September, it's anniversary season, and uh, my friend's telling me about a conversation that she had with a friend of hers where the woman's husband, she knew, was going to forget their anniversary. And, you know, days before the anniversary, the woman is already, she's planning on uh, how angry she's going to get when he forgets, right? And, and he's telling her about the plans he's making, and, and he's going to play golf, and she knows, ah, that means he's forgotten. And so... The way the story came to me was my friend was saying that, that the advice she gave her friend was start with the end in mind, right? Like, what do you want? Do you want to be in a fight? Do you want, you know, right? do you want to, do you want him to be grudgingly cancel all of his plans and, uh, you know, and take you out to dinner and you guys are going to glower at each other or, or do you want the romance, right? And if you want the romance, why don't you just make him breakfast in bed and wake him up and, you know, happy anniversary, honey. And you know how that plays out, right? It, Instead of a fight, like he's going to have that oh crap moment, and he's gonna, you know it's going to be a plastic smile. He's going to finish breakfast, and then he's going to go cancel all of his plans for the day and make dinner. And you know, and you know, is it a guaranteed win? No. Is it counterintuitive? Yes. But it's the most likely approach to get you to what you want. And I thought the story was really, really telling. And and I don't I don't mean to paint stereotypes like that. It was not the the point of the story. It just happens to be a story that I actually heard employers are in the position of the wife in this story. They want their employees to be brand advocates in a very sustainable way. They're not going to get there by pushing policies down employees' throats and overwhelming them with, with you know, tweetable phrases that they want their employees to copy and paste and you know, push out to their friends. That, that wouldn't get me to be an advocate. I don't think it would get you to be an advocate. And most of the managers who run those programs, when I ask them, they're like, yeah, yeah you know, I would never do this. But my employees need something different. Baloney. You know, you manager, you were once an employee, right? Give them what you would have wanted. Start with the end in mind. If you want them to be an advocate, then give them the respect an advocate is due. You know, give them, sell them on why the company is good for them. Make them partners in, in the employer branding process. Talk to them like human beings, but more specifically, give them a very concrete, simple way to use the company's message for themselves. Right? If, if you do that for me as an employee, right, rather than you know, give, push this policy to me, if you give me guidelines 
tell me what's expected. Show me what a win looks like. And then say, hey, Jason, by the way, you know what? I know, um, you know you're in HR, you, you do all this. Did you know that our company uh, invests X in its people? Did you know that you know, we're, we're on the forefront of, uh, you know, we're, we're doing all this wonderful stuff and we keep winning awards? Did you know that the program that you're on, as a matter of fact, is an award-winning program? And it, a lot of people don't even, don't even know the truth about where they work. So if you came to me and you said that, and then you said, hey, you know, and I know, look, you want to go out on Friday night and look good in front of your friends. You want to have an elevator pitch that makes you the most interesting person in the room for a few minutes. Why don't you, why don't you use one of these little tidbits as part of your elevator pitch? And instead of telling the world, yeah, I'm in HR, tell the world, yeah, look, I'm, I'm lucky. I get, to, <laughs> I get to contribute to one of the world's foremost, most progressive HR programs. Boom. Suddenly, if you give me that, I will be an advocate for your company because I understand how it helps me. And you, you don't have to cram policy down my throat. I'm going to be on brand. I'm going to be accurate. I'm going to want to share information because it's helping me. That's how companies can do this in a sustainable way. I mean, well, I, I hope this is how because I've staked my entire business on the idea that this is <laughs> you know, feasible and doable. But this is where we've had success and, and more success, I think, than you know, just when you try that cram down. Well, I, I think you need to go back when, when we post the podcast up and um, transcribe or replay or rewrite everything that you've just said for probably the last seven minutes, because I think your blog post is start with the end in mind. And you probably have a whole series. <laughs> like I, I'm like, whoa. My, my takeaway there was, did I really just, did I really just roll for seven minutes? That's such a no, no. I know. I don't know if you did, but I was just, <laughs> I'm just throwing out a number, but still, yeah. um, I, I was captivated. So, and I think that starting with the end in mind and using, like, I love when I'm telling stories and, and speaking or on a webinar or wherever using, uh, personal stories in that people can relate to and then placing them in like a workplace setting that they can kind of understand. So, uh, it, it is probably one of the best examples that I have heard about employment branding. I think uh, the average uh, person in a workplace can understand, start with the end in mind and, and here's why. So, um, it, I think it's wonderful. Awesome. Thank you. So, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about your blog, which, um, I've read for uh, many years. Um, uh, at jasonsiden.com. And so you have this series from 2013. Um, you know, it's from 2013, but still definitely applicable. It's a six uh, series blog. But you talk about employee ambassadors. Yeah. So in that year, because I feel like this is the employee ambassador employment branding space, it's all very, very new. How do you think it's changed um, in the last 12 months? Yeah, well, it's definitely heating up. That's for sure. Uh, we're seeing a lot of. Um, I know the I know the blog post you're talking about, and what what um, what spurred those was we had done a couple of research projects uh, a few years ago. We looked at the digital ad agency space, and you know I had this hypothesis that ad agencies would be the first to figure out that employees were potential advocates, and that that would be reflected in how they manage themselves. So we went onto LinkedIn uh, and we looked up uh, the top 50 digital ad companies according to AdAge. Uh, those companies had 51,806 uh, or 608 employees, whichever, uh, employees you know, on LinkedIn associated with those 50 companies. And what we found was 10% of those employees had any messaging anywhere on their profile that related back to the company's brand. So we, so we went online, we went to the websites, we went to the company's LinkedIn pages, we grabbed uh, information from them, you know, and you kind of envision what we did. We just created a word cloud and then took off all the generic words and any words that were unique to that company, um, you know, or specific to, to what that company did, boom, right? That's, that became part of the company's brand. And, you know, we, since we're dealing with digital ad agencies, you'd think that that of these 51,000 employees, words like marketing and digital would show up all over the place, and they just didn't. Uh, they, they just fell off precipitously. And when you kind of summed everything up, 10% of employees had anything on their profile that you could relate back to their, to their employer. 
This shocked us. And so, you know, a year later, we redid the survey. We looked at the top 25 best places to work from the fortune list. Uh, you know, China Gorman is now running this organization. They do wonderful work. But we, we looked at the top 25 companies and we grabbed employees from each of them. And we found uh, only 20% of their employees uh, had anything really on brand to say about their company. And, right, and these are companies that are actively spending money to develop and promote employer brands and their employees were not advocating for them. So uh, that was the genesis of this, of this blog post where we went through the what's going on and how do you turn the ship. Uh, and in, really in 2014, on the, on the corporate side, we're starting to see more vendors talk about this. Really, the, the, the heat is around uh, companies that have been content sharing companies marketing management companies, employee, uh, social employee management companies, they're starting to use this kind of language to describe what they do. The services haven't really turned yet. Uh, and, and we know that because I continue to do research in the market. Uh, and you know, it, you know, I, wrote a, I wrote a post, it's posted on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, if you're such a great company, why aren't your employees talking? And as part of that, we actually looked at CVS this year, 2014, you know, and what we found, you know, CVS has this huge, we're not smoking anymore campaign. And when they announced it, they wrapped all of this, this, you know, corporate social responsibility and it's the right thing to do language around it. And they have these slick videos that their, uh, that their, uh, their CEO and their head of marketing had out there. And you know how many of their employees had anything to say about the campaign on LinkedIn or Facebook or, or their Twitter bios? One. Their social media manager had one no smoking photo on her Facebook page, and that was it. Nobody else had anything to say. So, you know, we so we we we're seeing these we're seeing companies um, we're seeing vendors starting to talk about it, but it, it doesn't seem yet to have caught up uh, with the masses. Where where I do see um, where I do see some traction is that we see a lot of interest. Uh, we've had a lot of our sales cycles um, have gotten very interesting. We we have a number of companies who have kind of raised their hand and said, "Whoa, we get it. Employer brand, employee. This is a change effort. Let's get HR and marketing at the table." So we have, we have had a couple of pilots um, and smaller programs that were flying under the radar or were just recruiting. All of a sudden, got sucked up to that C level and the C level saying, "Okay, we see what's going on here." Let's make a let's make sure this is a program, uh, but I think it's going to be another year or two before companies really start to. Um, you know, it's going to be playtime for a year, and in about a year, that's when we're going to see the real impact of employee advocacy uh, in the market. Are there some examples right now of companies who you think are doing it right? Yeah, but you know, there's drinking games about using their names and things like this. So I don't have any alcohol near me, and. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, I mean, look, it's it's the usual suspects, and um, you know, I'm not gonna I'm, I'm not gonna name the Las Vegas company because you know I think everyone will roll their eyes if I do. But any company that's true to itself, uh, you know, we, there, there's a there's a company, and unfortunately, I can't name them because they're a client. But this is a company in a regulated industry, and it's not somebody who you would necessarily think of having a great employer brand, but they're true to themselves. They have their uh, you know they're they're a regulated industry very stodgy industry, very conservative uh, company, uh, very tech savvy company. And they have this employer brand about being, look, we're conservative. Uh, we move fast for our industry, but slow relative to everybody else. And the trade-off is you get stability. And we are always testing new technologies. And when we test a new technology, oh my gosh, do we have to test it? Because this is the scale it has to work on. And these are all the, the compliance regulations. And you know what? They do a great job hiring tech talent because they're just true to themselves. They're not trying to compete with Google. They're not trying to compete with. All. They are just true to themselves. Uh, there are there are examples like that in every industry. Um, you know, and and what it comes down to, Jessica, is anybody who um, you know. I talked to. I, I have a, a webinar next week with uh, with Chili's. Uh, Chili's does a great job. And I'm not saying that Chili's is a perfect company in this, but they know where they are. They, you know, they've, they've identified a crawl, walk, run path. They know where they are, what their next step is, and what they need to do to get to that next step. 
that kind of self-awareness is what makes a, a company great. And you can find them all over the place. They, they have a good story about how they have turned their company around and, and really have embraced, I think, they're called Chili Heads, uh, their mm -hmm. employee population. And um, they um, are they're a really passionate group of people who, that, you know, that love love chilies. Well, yeah, and I mean, look, in, in food service, I mean, you have, you've got chilies, Young Brands does a great job with this. Uh, you know, our friends over at Sodexo do a bang up job. Uh, you know, but you know what I what I would caution anybody listening uh, to consider is the companies that are doing a really good job. They built their campaign based on what's true. They started with the end in mind. They did not try to outguess. Right? Management didn't sit in a room and try and guess what employees wanted. They actually found out, and and then they built their programs to suit. So you know, there's there's been a lot of traction about a particular. Uh, Las Vegas company, you know, moving to talent communities and getting rid of, uh, you know, a more traditional resume submission process, that works for them. It may not work for anybody else. It's incredible that they can do it. But, but the, the takeaway is not, oh, talent communities are going to replace ATSs. The, the takeaway is, oh my gosh, if we're true to ourselves, there's some really creative stuff that we may be able to do for ourselves to drive incredible amounts of efficiency and effectiveness in our in our recruiting and, and retention processes. I, I agree with you. And it's funny because uh, when that comes out, like the, the story broke about the talent communities and, and granted, I, 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 I'm an advocate of talent, talent communities, but the thing was is that everybody kind of rushes, like all the momentum shifts, like I'm going to abandon everything I've been doing for the last 36 months to talk to my employees and we're going to institute a talent committee. I don't, I don't think that that's um, the best strategy. It's not a good strategy at all. You need to, like you said, do what's right for your company. And, and that starts with understanding who your employees are and what they are. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned um, in the blog series on jasonsiden.com was uh, a 2013 Edelman Trust Barometer, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> it allows, I guess, um, it, it is measuring um, when you put information out as an employer, um, determining what the most trusted channel was. Yeah. Um, and so I'm just going to read these uh, stats because just because I mean, I'm not surprised, but it's nice to hear this. Um, and it's also nice as a HR recruiting person, if you're going to your CEO and saying, look, we need to talk about like building an employee brand or talking with our employees and, and creating a brand advocacy program, this would be good information to pull um, from Edelman's trust barometer. So 2013 said that 63% of people trusted employees will give them straight information and what it's like at a place to work. 21% said that they trust what the CEO says and 11% trust the company's media. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> right? So, you know, what does that tell you? Uh, and by the way, it, if, uh, if you start looking up employee advocacy and employer branding, I, I think you'll find the Edelman Trust Barometer is probably the most off-cited uh, source of, uh, of data justifying the move into this space. And you know, so the numbers move a little bit from year to year, but it's incredible, right? And, 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 and let's be really careful about how we, we dissect these numbers. About six times the number of people will trust your employees versus trust your company spokespeople. And if a company sees that and takes the little kid soccer approach that you just talked about, right, that little kid soccer, like everybody races to the ball, uh, what those companies are going to do is they're going to go, oh, well, all we have to do is take our press release and give it to our employees and then people will believe it. But the reality is, is that if you do that, you're going to erode your employees as a, a channel for trusted information, right? There's a reason why six times as many people trust your employees as your company spokesman. There's a reason that three times as many of them, you know, as many people trust your employees as your CEO in 2013. And the reason is, is that everybody knows your company has something to sell. As soon as you turn your people into shills for the company, you're going to train the world that your, your employees have something to sell and trust in them is going to plummet. Instead, what, you know, the real takeaway here, it's far more strategic. It, it's, oh, the world, because of social media, 
communication has been democratized. We don't control this channel anymore. What that means is the world has found a way around our puffery to get to what's real. And the world has an insatiable appetite for the truth. That's the takeaway. And so that should trigger all kinds of processes around everything we were talking about before. Start with the end in mind. You want your employees to be advocates. You need them to say what's true. How do we get them to self-identify with the brand and then get them to, to talk about the, the, the stuff that helps them be awesome in their communities? Because then they'll share our information and it will be believable because it will be true. And we can, right, that's, that's the lesson. Uh, it's a little bit more of a sophisticated lesson, but it's the only one ultimately that works. Good, good. And I, I just want to mention to anyone who's uh, listening out in podcast land, if you ever, ever again, and I see you post on LinkedIn Publisher, your press release, I will come and smack you. <laughs> that is not a tool. Like, write, write a blog post about why you're excited to work at this company and the news. Don't just copy and paste that press release out there because it totally defeats the whole purpose uh, that what this platform was built for. So sidebar, but. I will carry your battering ram for you <laughs> when you show up at that person's door. I send people private messages. I will message them on LinkedIn and say, what the heck are you doing? And, um, but then again, you know, I work for myself, so um, I can do that. And, um, you know, <coughs> right. I guess people expect those things. But yeah, please don't do that. Don't, don't make me message you. Yeah, but, and, but I mean, you know, and back to what you were saying, like the idea your employees are a far more trusted channel than your um, than your company spokesman. So you absolutely should embrace them as a as a vehicle for getting the message out. The way in which you embrace them, if you make them partners, if you can work together to get the message out, that's good. If you just turn them into shells for the company, you're basically going to reduce their effectiveness to the same effectiveness that your that your official channels happen. Well, people will just kind of ignore and I mean, you know, I do that sometimes on LinkedIn, like I uh, are not LinkedIn, but Facebook, I, I have my list. And if I'm tired of hearing somebody talk and spew, um, you know, and keep promoting, self-promoting themselves, their blog, their platform, whatever it is over and over and over again, and not be part of the conversation or share things of value, I tune them out. And, and so I think that's... It, it, that's one way um, we want to focus on letting employees share their stories from their point of view and not just be this sort of distribution network. Yeah. And, and, you know, yes, the beautiful thing is that when you have your employees share their own stories and give them that opportunity to like, so, you know, our, our tool, we call it the brand amper and this is what it does. It helps people tell their own stories and use the company's story to do it. The amazing thing is, is that you don't need to exert control because you end up with this bell curve of data and you can actually see, oh, here's how people are talking about the company or not talking about the company. And you get an idea of where your advocates are and what is it about the company that resonates. So it's, it, it's actually very empowering to give that choice to folks and to see where they take it. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about you because um, we're kind of cruising towards the finish line here. Uh, where can they go to learn more about Jason and, and your company and, and just all about you? So, yeah, and it's all about me, isn't it? <laughs> Until we get off the call, then it's going to be all about you. Uh, no, thank you. I appreciate that. So you mentioned my blog, jasonsiden.com. Uh, our company is, uh, it, you, can, you can find me at workforcemarketing.com. And, uh, you know, and I'm across social media, Seiden, S-E-I-D-E-N. So Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. If you just search for my last name, uh, you will find me. That's the benefit of having an unusual last name. <laughs> There's more of them now than there were when, uh, when I was growing up. But uh, yeah, it's the benefit of being an early adopter with a, an unusual enough last name. Well, I, I want to thank you, Jason, for taking time to stop by the Workology podcast. I really appreciate you joining us. Hey, listen, this is your, I really appreciate being the inaugural. Thank you so much, Jessica. It was a pleasure. It's been fun. It's been fun. And it, thank you to you for tuning in. Thanks for joining the Workology podcast. This is Jessica Miller Merrill, where we're discussing the science and art of the workplace, HR and recruitment. Until next time, you can visit bloggingforjobs.com or our recruiting blog called therecruiterslounge.com to learn more about human resources and recruitment and, uh, 
Also, we, we do have a series on uh, recruitment, marketing, and employment branding. So there's just tons of information out there. Uh, check out Jason, take a look at his blog, and uh, hit us up if you have any questions. Thank you for tuning in. Production services for Workology provided by Total Picture Media.